Hi, this is Mrs. Marita. Welcome to AP Stats Lesson 4.1D. Our learning target for today is 4.1 number 5. Explain how under coverage, non-response, question wording, and other aspects of a sample survey can lead to bias. Today's lesson is going to focus on bias, or more specifically, how to hopefully avoid bias. When designing a sample survey, random sampling helps avoid bias. That's giving everyone an equal chance to be part of the sample selected. But there are other kinds of mistakes in the sampling process that even if we do a random sample, there's still some issues that can lead to inaccurate information about the population. For instance, if a sampling method is designed in a way that leaves out certain segments of the population, the sample survey suffers from undercoverage. When selected individuals cannot be contacted or refuse to participate, the survey suffers from non-response bias. Finally, if a question is worded in a way that favors certain responses or the surveyor leads the sample subject into a certain direction, the survey suffers from response bias. In today's lesson, we're going to define these with a little more detail next, and then we'll do an example of each type. This table summarizes for us the four main types of bias. The first is under coverage. Under coverage occurs when some members of the population are less likely to be chosen or cannot be chosen for the sample. Non-response bias occurs when an individual chosen for the sample can't be contacted or refuses to participate. These two get mixed up a lot. With under coverage, some part of your population of study is completely left out and they have no chance to participate. With under coverage, these subjects don't even have the opportunity to make the list of those to be sampled. It's like they didn't even exist. With non-response, all members of your population have a chance to participate equally. But, usually because of the way the researchers decide to contact subjects, some do not get the opportunity to respond or they refuse to respond even though they made a list of those to be sampled. Third is response bias. Response bias occurs when there's a systematic pattern of inaccurate or untruthful answers to a survey question. And last is question wording. The wording of a question systematically influences the responses. That was a lot of vocab. Let's do an example. 4.1 example 6. Identify what's wrong with the following surveys and how the issues could have affected the results of each survey. Part A. A journalism class prints a survey in their school newspaper about the school possibly charging next semester for student parking. I know, we already charge for that. Let's just play along. If students have a 3.5 GPA or higher, the fee will be waived. That means no paying for parking for those kiddos. Readers are asked to clip out the survey from the paper, complete it, and turn it into a Dropbox managed by the students in the quad. What could go wrong? <laughs> This example is actually not a type of bias, but a poor sampling strategy. This is an example of voluntary response sampling, a little bit of a review. Students with a GPA of 3.5 or higher will probably respond in greater numbers and care more because they can receive free parking next semester. This may lead to a result that over predicts the number of students who support this proposal. Part B. A survey paid for the makers of disposable diapers found that 84% of the sample opposed banning disposable diapers. Here's the actual question they used. It is estimated that disposable diapers account for less than 2% of the trash in today's landfills. In contrast, beverage containers, third class mail, what you can't see is my dog walking all over me, where you go pebbles, let's continue. Um, in contrast, beverage containers, third class mail, and yard waste are estimated to account for 21% of the trash in landfills. Given this, in your opinion, would it be fair to ban disposable diapers? This is how data is collected, everybody. Well, some data, <laughs> not legitimate data. So we're going to say, uh, even though we're unclear of how the sample was selected, they didn't tell us. Whenever you're looking at research, look for how they collected the data. If this was a convenient sample or a voluntary response, then we already know there's issues in the data being representative of our population. So in this case, we'll assume they took a nice, simple, random sample that's representative. But even if they did that, Due to the question wording, there's most likely bias in our survey results. The question is clear, but the information that's provided before the question about the landfill contents makes the question slanted. They also use some loaded vocabulary like, is it 
fair to ban disposable diapers, that kind of loaded vocabulary could put a subject on the spot and feel like they're pressured into giving one response. Part C. A leading research firm is contacted to survey American adults on their preferences of candidates for the upcoming election. They use a computer program to randomly contact individuals through their landlines between the hours of 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. Oh, I provided some diagrams for what a landline phone is for you. These are ones that are attached to the wall, well, at least some part of it, not a cell phone. Whoa, lots of action. Here we go. So this is an SRS. Just because it's an SRS, though, a simple random sample, this could lead to non-response bias and under coverage. So we're going to talk about both. Both of these yielding a sample that is not representative of the population of American adults. So there's two issues going on here, and this was really common with um, surveys, especially as we're transitioning to more people having cell phones and not the landline phones. Data collection had to take a pause and figure out how to keep up with the technology. So landline phones were, used to be at least, a lot easier to contact you on. So the non-response issue could occur because people selected may be at work and unavailable to answer their home phone during these specific hours. If you think about who's home between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., it's probably not your average working adult or college student. If you are working, well, you're not home to answer your landline phone. Maybe that's why you have a cell phone with you, but that's not what they're calling. They're calling a landline phone. So individuals who are employed are not going to be able to be contacted. This leaves individuals who are unemployed or retired um, or maybe just work untraditional hours. That's who's going to be home and available to answer the survey. That population who actually responds to the survey may have a very different opinion on candidates than those who are working. Another issue would be under coverage. So under coverage could occur because there's a growing part of the population we know that no longer has landline phones. That's me, that's me. <laughs> so I don't have a landline phone. So some adults like me, I only have a cell phone. So because of this, I'd be left out and unable to be selected for the survey. That's the under coverage. I'm part of the sampling frame. I'm an adult and they want the opinion of American adults on the upcoming election. But if they only call landline phones, there's no way for me to be included because I don't have a landline phone. Part D. What percent of American adults wash their hands after using the bathroom? Should be 100%. But let's continue. It depends on how you collect the data. This is true. A lot of surveys, depending on how you collect the data, you'll get very different results. In a telephone survey of 1,006 U.S. adults, 96% said they washed their hands after using a public restroom. Come on, 4%. An observational study of 6,028 adults in public restrooms told a different story. Only 85% of those observed washed their hands after using the restroom. So you're going to use your QR code to complete this example in your notes in more detail, but the big idea is if somebody came up to you and asked, do you always wash your hands when you use the restroom? Um, yeah, I do. But yeah, like who's going to say no? That might be embarrassing. Well, I guess about 4% of us will still say no. But if you observe individuals, 85% of those observed actually wash their hands. Well, that's a big difference than 96%. And so when you have this face-to-face -face interaction, it kind of puts you on the spot. This is a response bias, so we're systematically getting a response that is not representative of the population. When you talk to somebody face up to face, they are probably uncomfortable if they know they did not wash their hands the last time they went to the restroom. So they'll probably say yes, where if you observe them, well, that's them in their natural habitat and you're getting the real data here. So response bias, in this case, they're being untruthful. There's some difference in the population who is saying they wash their hands when they really don't.